Welcome to a super special episode of the Archetypal Mosaic. This is Mikhail Tank. On the phone is an incredible professor, Professor Craig Wright, who graduated from the Eastman School of Music, holds a PhD from Harvard in musicology, and taught at Yale for 44 years, where as the Moses Professor of Music Emeritus, he continues to teach the Genius Course. Wright has been the recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship, an honorary doctorate of the Humane Letters of the University of Chicago, and in 2011 was elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. We're going to be discussing his recent book called The Hidden Habits of Genius, Beyond Talent, IQ, and Grit, Unlocking the Secrets of Greatness, which was also a chosen Amazon Best Book of October 2020. Welcome to the Archetype of Mosaic. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, Enrico. Delighted to be here. Uh, I'm delighted as well, and so is the audience, I'm certain. Um, first of all, this incredible book, which is available at your local bookstores and on Amazon and via all most uh, retailers, again called The Hidden Habits of Genius. What inspired you to write this book? Um, a, a interesting question. I guess it's, it's in, in a way it's a life history, a life journey. I started out trying to be a concert pianist and very quickly uh, after graduating from the Eastman School of Music found out I was never going to make a dime doing that because I didn't have any musical talent or had very little musical talent in it. Then I got a PhD at Harvard, as you mentioned, um, and became a college professor teaching the uh, three B's of classical music, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. Bumped into this fellow named Mozart, an M of music especially with that 1984 film Amadeus, which is a really wonderful thing. And I got, um, then uh, started looking at some of the materials of Leonardo da Vinci and began to see commonalities with Mozart. And then, well, that encouraged me to read uh, something about the sciences, just the biographies of Einstein. And, and over time, uh, I began to um, see things that I thought um, hadn't been articulated before. Um, and in this regard, I'm reminded Reminded what people uh, such as Steve Jobs and Bezos uh, would be thinking or doing. Bezos used the express, expression "creative discontent." Well, I'm certainly no genius, but but I think I had a, a creative discontent there because I was seeing these commonalities in these great minds, but I didn't think these commonalities had been teased out and indeed put up front and center the way they should be. And my attempt to put them up front and center is what gave rise to this book. Uh, tell me, in terms of um, being at Harvard and getting your PhD there, how was that experience for you? And did you feel that you had enough freedom to be an individual? <laughs> Hey, that, that's very interesting because, as I say, look, I'm a kid from Hyattsville, Maryland, um, at, or as we used to say back, back there, they say Hyattsville, Maryland. It's actually a two-syllable word if you're really from there, and that's how you know the people that are really from there. Maryland. Okay. Um, Merlin. Merlin. Uh, it's just it's just the, the local accent. Balmer Merlin. Okay. Only four syllables in those words. It sounds and like Merlin. Even, um, I, I was not born of privilege. My parents were very middle class. Um, uh, my education was all public school. And for me, when I arrived at Harvard, this great bastion of, of education and to, to a degree privilege, I was one something of a parvenu and a nouveau arrivé or whatever, um, um, wondering at all of this, feeling very much out of place, yet at the same time absolutely fascinated and intrigued by all of the wonderful things that, are, that were around me. Now, the reason I chose Harvard, and I still would choose it today in many respects, is not because it's necessarily the best school, but it's because it's in, a, in, it's in Boston. If you want a synergy between the best school and the best location, it may be Harvard and Boston or MIT and Boston, because then you have the museums and you have the Boston Symphony and you have the Boston Red Sox. And I was sucking all of this in and it was all just uh, a kid in toy land in, in a way. Um, and uh, so that's what was so wonderful about Harvard. I was both exhilarated and intimidated. Wonderful. Um, so how does music relate to genius? Because, you know, it's interesting that music is one of those categories where genius is very clearly shown, as opposed to other more subjective elements where genius can be more hidden. Uh, how do you relate the two? 
Yeah, that's a that's a good question. The way you you phrased it there, uh, uh, Mikhail. Um, the um, issue really is twofold with regard to music. First, there is a um, a talent, and I'm going to call it a talent, a natural gift for performance. And then there's something very different, which is a natural gift or an ability to create. And I would say that the first group, and that's what I was trying to do when I was going to Eastman School of Music, was to become a performer. I don't think that's genius. I think uh, the genius is, is not, say, Yo-Yo Ma, who plays the cello in such a spectacular way. The genius is somebody like Mozart or Beethoven, uh, whose music, whose creation, Yo-Yo Ma and so many other people uh, uh, have played over the centuries. So I think at the outset we should make that uh, distinction between the capacity to reproduce uh, what has already been produced as opposed to the capacity to produce something that is new and innovative, innovative that changes uh, the world. Um, so that's, that's, what, uh, that's what's of, of interest there. And uh, really, uh, as those two play out in, in similar sorts of ways in mathematics, I think you can be gifted for mathematics, but that doesn't necessarily make you uh, creative in mathematics. So for me, creativity is is hugely important. And then you begin to look at the different composers and see how their geniuses, uh, you know, whether we talk about musical geniuses, I can name my favorites, but most interesting. Uh, but what was it that made them geniuses? What were their personal characteristics? How, What distinguishes them as geniuses? You know, uh, I happen to be a true creative. I've released a plethora of books, music, radio shows, everything. And, you know, what I'd like to discuss with you the concept of creativity and genius. You know, for example, for me, I don't like to follow people or reproduce anything. I go into the archetypal realm through my soul and I choose whatever all these options come to me these thoughts and I choose which ones I'm interested in I bring them in and then I you know bring them into reality and I'm wondering from your perspective in terms of uh, the common traits and behaviors of genius throughout history whether it's Mozart or Beethoven or da Vinci what were their ways of connecting to the archetypal realm or how would you call that space from which they got originality instead of reproduction? Well, um, if we knew that, and we could bottle that, and we could sell that, you and I wouldn't be doing this right now. We'd be on some desert island in Tahiti, the, the richest uh, person since King Let's Minus. go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the secret. That's the that's the trick. I mean, how how, how and where where and how does the magic happen? And that that's just in essence one of, one of the issues that I try to to dig to dig into in in the book. Um, and uh, these are the so called hidden habits or enablers of of genius. And and we could work through uh, them in sequence or to pick on a few that happen to interest you, but. Uh, but it's not always the same. Um, I, I love this expression. It, it, this is a necessary but insufficient cause. In other words, you've got to have it, but you've got to have a lot of other things too. Or you could have this one, but you've got to have a lot of other things too. Or you could have this uh, enabler of genius or this ingredient of genius or driver of genius, whatever you want to call it. But you've got to have these other things too. So there's no prescriptive formula, remedy, uh, recipe out there that is going to generate. It's, uh, what was that fancy Latin expression, sui generis. So that, you know, it uh, rests there uh, unto itself. So uh, we we could talk about these, but as but as we do so, we must remember that at the end of this, we're not going to be able to come up with, we shouldn't expect our listeners to expect a, a surefire formula for genius. Uh, let's go back to your three favorite uh, music uh, creators, genius creators throughout history, and uh -huh. also if you can com connect a few of their traits and behaviors that they share. Okay. Um, well, I, I, the aforementioned Mozart. Mm -hmm. That's what got me into Mozart. Got me into the. FBI. I don't know if you've watched that uh, I have. movie, Mike. I have. Um, it's it's spectacular and it doesn't age. So we should all watch it. It's and he just dies so, so so horribly. Yeah. 
Um, it won eight Academy Awards, mm -hmm. which I think was a record at the time. Um, but um, it, it's uh, just glorious, and it does a pretty good job of uh, por portraying Mozart. So, uh, so but with Mozart, we talk about all right. So, what are the drivers here? I would say with Mozart, it's natural gifts. He had he, this was extraordinary what he could do. And he didn't necessarily have to work for this. He had to work for the comp composition, but the natural gifts of a performer. And, and then they begin to morph over into a creator. What were his natural gifts? Absolute or perfect pitch. Uh, uh, what I call, like to call a phonographic memory, not a photographic memory for visual images, but a, a phonograph, uh, uh, an eidetic memory for sounds. He could, there are famous examples. He would walk into, uh, the, well, he walked into the Sistine Chapel when he was, what, 14 years old, heard a piece that runs for about five minutes, walked back to his room and wrote down this particular piece all of it and it's in five parts uh, that's not easy in other words five voices simultaneously that's not easy to do uh, there was a case where at one time he was a youth somewhere in Germany uh, and he heard a string quartet by a now forgotten composer named Campini six months later he finds himself in Paris and somebody said oh yeah I remember we met together there and somebody played um, Campini's quartet could you uh, recreate for us Campini's quartet and he goes to the piano and does a piano reduction of this piece he heard only once. It had never been published because most music wasn't published in that day. Uh, and he just, he just played it. He had a memory like that. And he, of course, he was a phenomenal performer because he had a kind of a per perfect uh, hand-eye coordination. He could hear uh, or see a note on the page and know it exactly instantaneously and infallibly to the spot there uh, of a keyboard or violin which to, to generate that sound. So with Mozart, I'd say they're the driver of genius his natural gifts. With Beethoven, it's very different. He was gifted also. But with Beethoven, I think of, of this almost obsessive, unhappy individual. He was unhappy, made everybody around him unhappy, although he wrote glorious music. Um, he was obsession, obsessive, he was passionate, and he was a contrarian, I think, in his thinking. What he did with the symphony was very much out of the ordinary, for example. What he played, the style of, that he created on the piano was very much out of the ordinary. So I think of Beethoven as the, the sort of passionate, obsessive contrarian. With Wagner, I think, uh, who is my third of these uh, very influential composers, um, influential geniuses, uh, with, with Wagner, Richard Wagner, uh, a little bit out of favor today, but if you've ever watched something like a, a Star Wars film or... Um, uh, oh, I'm blocking on the other. See, well, even uh, some of the well, the Tolkien novels that had been put up on film. Uh, that's all Wagnerian. In it, the notion of the, uh, the fantasy sequence, the type of uh, super over-the-top romantic orchestra that backs it up, the notion of sequence after sequence of episodes. That's all Richard Wagner. He figured this out in the 1850s, really. Um, he could see a target that nobody else could see. So to review here just a bit, I would say that with with uh, Mozart, it's natural gifts, with Beethoven, it's obsession, obsessive contrarian thinking, and with Wagner, it's imagination, seeing a target that no one else not only can hit, but no one else can see. Do you believe that in some part, genius is a privilege by God? Hmm. In terms of it being a birth, uh, given talent that has to be found and nourished by the person or can it in some way be learned well i i suppose the answer is it's there and it's more a question of can you release it can you put yourself in a situation in the course of life where by doing certain things, your capacities are fully uh, expressed, fully revealed? I think that's what's, that's what's going on. In a sense, can you get out of your own way to become everything that you can be? 
Um, and that involves, in the course of life, figuring out maybe what you're not so good at, maybe figuring out what you don't like. And as life goes on and you get lucky, you figure out what you do like. And generally speaking, if you like something, you're going to become obsessive about it, passionate about it, and you're most likely to end up uh, with a, a far better uh, result and, and, and a result that might ultimately uh, change the world, which meets my definition of genius. So I think I'd like to think of it in those terms. It's not so much you're born with this or that. Yes, you're born, but can you figure out through your energies, particularly your curiosity, how to open a series of doors that will allow you to be all that you can be? Um, now, you mentioned that originally you wanted to compose yourself. Let me ask you, when you go into a dream state or, uh, you know, into the dawn um, of your mind, um, what what is your perfect creation of music sound like? How would you describe it, which you maybe can't create? Well, um, just to be, be absolutely um, uh, truth in advertising here, full disclosure, actually, I'm not sure I said that. I don't think, uh, Mikhail, that in, I have ever had the slightest desire to compose anything in my entire life. And I think this brings me back to an earlier statement where I said, you know, I have very little um, musical gifts. I have very little in the way of musical abilities. You probably have much more uh, God-given musical ability than I I do. So, well, how did you end up in music? Because my mother thought I was going to be the next, next man Clyburn, and I had a very strong work ethic, and even though it was a middle-class household, was given a piano and, and suggested I practice, and I did. So, talent can take you a long way, but ultimately only so far. What interests me, but so my creativity, I think, what I've learned over time, I have a, if I have a gift, it is taking complex issues, and I've done this with classical music, and with with things such as genius also and try to simplify these complexities down to a cohort of easily understood principles that the average education person can can understand um, and then maybe express them in a way that they find interesting. So, so strangely, I think my gift, though I started in music and was a professor of music for all my life, I'm much stronger than I am in uh, expository and creative writing than I am in music. Got it. Um, I understand. Um, next question is, what additional care do genius people need to make sure their lives are wholesome and complete? Meaning that when you become so obsessed with a gift of developing or removing your ungifts, um, what additional care and, and you know do you need to make sure that you you know that you're wholesome that that like a lot of these geniuses they may die young or or have disproportionate lives maybe without love or relationships or this or that what needs to be done to create a wholesome environment i'm not sure that you can do it um, greatness may come from destruction, destruction of the individual and destruction of the people around that individual. Um, I was thinking in another context this morning, once again, but what this question raises and the answer that I've suggested raises once again in my mind how the universe, how the world works. And I think the more I think about it, it's a, it's a kind of continual ageless battle of opposites mm -hmm. um, it, life and death the yin and the yang mm -hmm. that sort of thing so here we have greatness and destruction going hand in hand creative destruction uh, as a uh, Harvard economist Schumpeter uh, uh, wants to call it um, and so uh, the whole notion of the quality which everybody talks about today and exceptionalism well how do they play out aren't they forces contrary forces doing uh, battle all the time so um i don't think what reading the lives of these geniuses that they led holistic well integrated uh either holistic or wholesome lives oftentimes they they were destructive the only thing i would say is that they did live very long lives 
if you look at this, and I go into this in some detail in the book there, if you look at the longevity of geniuses, it's not like Schubert and Mozart and Kurt Cobain and Sylvia Plath, these, these geniuses that die young. They are the exceptions, they're sensational, and they get a lot of attention. But if you add up the ages of, of people, well, even Einstein, um, but Michelangelo, 88, or uh, Giuseppe Verdi into his 80s, and they're still producing, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, these geniuses are outliving their cohorts by, on average, a decade. So, and why is that the case? Because they are passionate about something. They think they can change the world. They have the reason to get out of bed every morning and get going. They are optimists. Optimists live, live a, a great deal longer. And studies show, and I could cite the studies, um, uh, show that the optimists live much longer than pessimists. So they, these people are obsessive optimists um, who do not, in my mind, lead these uh, holistic and, and wholesome lives. I'm going to ask you a very strange question now uh, that came to me. You know, sometimes when you hear, let's say, a genius perform or play or do anything, it touches you so deeply to the core that you get, you know, goosebumps. At that right. point, when that experience occurs to a person, it's uh -huh. so enveloping, uh, mind, body, soul, a complete kind of... Uh -huh. um, mesmerizing. Do you believe that that kind of experience is so powerful that it goes through the person up into uh, their greater self, up to heaven perhaps, or the creative forces above us, and delivers it to them? No, I think it's a physiological experience, and I, there are people that have, there are um, uh, neuroscientists who have studied this phenomenon and studied it in the brain and watch what happens um, uh, in terms of the distribution of neurotransmitters and neurochemicals in the brain, um, and uh, some of the uh, some of the sensations that are experienced there are the same sensations you experience when taking drugs. Drugs, and we don't want to encourage the latter, but um, it, it is this kind of off-the-wall excitement or a sense of almost out-of-body experience that one can experience. But I don't think it's a, a moment of divine intervention, divine communication. I think it's more uh, uh, um, an example of, of, of species, in this case Homo sapiens, um, uh, their brain has developed um, in a particular kind of way and their brain and therefore ultimately their whole uh, neural complex uh, responds in a particular fashion. That's a great answer. That's where you and, uh, and I will... If you, but if you want, I'm sorry, if you if you want the, the, the dean on this, I, I was trying to remember his name, I think it's Joseph Zatori, Z-O-T-O-R-R-E, teaches at McGill University in, in, in a neuroscience institute up there at McGill. They've got some very good people. Uh, Daniel Levitin, who used to teach there, he wrote a book, Your Brain on Music, which is very, very interesting. Uh, so it's a combination of, of, of the psychology of music, the the neurobiology of music that that particular institute in Mag at McGill University in Montreal has been working with. I appreciate your answer on that. It's very specific, but that's where you and I slightly disagree. I believe that a person can uh -huh. transmit it further. Let's go to the next phase, which is how does self-awareness relate to genius? And the question is, because you know, in our in political ways, which we won't really talk about, you know, self-awareness is a big key to a lot of issues in our in our locations. Um, now, you mentioned the genius is getting out of your own way, which takes self-awareness. Um, and that concept of awareness of self and your gifts and all of that, how instrumental is that? Well, um, I don't, you know, I wish I could give you a really um, compelling, convincing answer there, uh, Mikael, but um, I, I can't. I, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, how instrumental is getting out of your own way, and is getting out of your own way, is that the same thing as... Um, 
the self-awareness. Um, self-awareness and these geniuses, I don't equate. They seem to be very much unaware of how they're perceived by other people. Um, maybe they are self-aware, however. Maybe they don't think about it. Maybe they act out of intuition. What is the difference between an act driven by self-awareness and an act driven by intuition. Maybe one is conscious, maybe the other is unconscious, but both are within the individual. So um, uh, I, I really, you know, um, that's why we have these discussions. I don't have I don't represent <laughs> having all the answers. I like discussions like this because you pose questions that cause me to think, and I probably will move down uh, farther down the road of enlightenment if there is such a thing. Um, to uh, uh, based on on your question, so good for you. I don't know the answer to that. It's a very interesting question, one we should all think about. Thank you. Okay, the next question would be throughout his. History, genius sometimes gets you know negativity jealousy towards them because uh, when they shine so brightly in society some people can feel insecure intimidated and can take uh, revenge against that in one form or another it could be very silent and calm it can be loud so how does genius protect itself from jealousy uh, you know, I wish I could remember it exactly. It's a great quote. It may have been Jonathan Swift. Um, it, it's the society um, will know the genius, can recognize the genius when all the dunces of the world are aligned in confederacy against him. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, uh, and that's typical. And we don't like these people. Why don't we like these people, these transformative figures? Because they cause us to change, and change usually means work. Uh, we can't use our default mode to get through life. We've got to do things differently, and that oftentimes uh, will take uh, labor. How do these people survive with all this antithesis, this hostility, all this negativity? They do so because they are hugely self-confident. They possess a certain degree of hubris, I suppose. Hubris bordering on self-delusion. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting question. I mean, the ones that are right uh, would be called uh, delusional. Mm -hmm. And they may have been thought of as delusional at the time. And other people were equally delusional. Maybe I, I'm delusional and thinking I can write another great book and I'll keep trying and then maybe at some point I say, this is a great book, but maybe I'm just being delusional. And all the time that's the problem with creative people. You don't know whether you have that next great book or that next great podcast in your case, or whether you are just fooling yourself. You are de deluding uh, yourself. But in the main, what happens is that these geniuses have such self-confidence, they are so self-confident what's going on, that they don't pay attention to negativity. They just continue to prosecute their own vision of the world. And if they are, if their vision proves correct, then we remember them as geniuses. If their vision proves wrong, then they were simply fools or lunatics crying in a desert somewhere. Uh, and that's once again a, a, a kind of I won't say maybe it's a conundrum, I don't know, but it's a, it's a point of, of di division in how this plays out between the, the successful uh, historical figure that is the genius and the, the figure that everybody immediately forgets about. You know, that's where the concept of, when you're talking about extreme self-confidence, uh, bordering on hubris, that's where self-awareness comes in because if you still have the combination of the of the extreme self-confidence and self-awareness then you don't become delusional but if you lose the self-awareness that's when you become delusional right well i guess so but but what happens if i don't know let me think through this um so uh, i'm hugely self-confident i believe that this is uh, but maybe i just don't have enough information to realize how absurd my notion of this next great book is going to be so is that 
is the, is that I mean, and, and these people make mistakes. They make you know, uh, Edison made huge mistakes, but he always had so many irons in the fire that he could recover. I mean, he went into I don't know if you know New Jersey at all, but it's not the mining capital of the world. But he wasted millions of dollars and uh, ten years of his life trying to extract high grade ore from the earth in the state of New Jersey, uh, and it just wasn't there, and he could never come up with a process that would would do him much good. In the course of failing, what he came up with was prefabricated cement, um, and he could build houses out of it, and he made a lot of money with that. We all know the story of, uh, between Edison and Tesla, uh, and here it's Edison again who is delusional, thinking that direct current is the w- way to the future, when uh, he was so deeply bought into this, and so cal- self-confident that this was the, the way this was going to play out, that he didn't really pay attention to the uh, obvious practicality over the long term, a long distance distribution of alternating current, as his rival Nikola Tesla uh, was arguing. So even you know you can be self confident, um, but you could be wrong. I guess maybe the takeaway there is uh, if you're self confident and wrong, you better have a lot of other things out there be a polymath so that enough of your ideas turn out to be right now let's briefly talk about confidence self-confidence and the power of confidence you know you mentioned that that is the the core in a way of of the light of the focus and um what do you think comprises of confidence? Is it exceptional faith and soul? Or what is the definition of it? I don't know. You've got a lot of good questions here, Mikael. Um, that's, a good, that's another one no one's ever asked me before. What is the essence of self-confidence? Well, what do you... Um, you go first. I mean, well, you, you go first. <laughs> that will give me a little time to think. So you tell me what you think it is. And, and maybe I'll have something uh, coherent to say by the time you're finished. I believe it's ex- extreme and full faith in one's soul. I don't know that I have a soul. <laughs> what, what does it mean to, uh, to, in one's soul? What is, this is a very good question. Is it like a metaphysic, a class we've entered down in metaphysics or, or um, uh, the stratospheric religion of one sort? What does it mean to have a, have a soul, a uh, personality? I mean, um, I think a soul, we're just a I think a soul critical. is separate from the self in a way. It's not like, you know, uh, it's not like a double mind. It's it's a separate element connected to the creative forces, to the higher being, to the divine, to the archetypal, to the genius. And it's a connection between that and then your regular human self, the one that just, you know, has to live. Um, the connection between those two things, I believe. But of course, that's just very subjective. Yeah, that's that's true, and it beca- again is a sort of almost a, a theological mm-hmm. explanation of things. I can tend to be having spent a lot of time as a gardener, uh, much more a chemical <laughs> the chemical solution. All just going to return to nitrogen and potassium and <laughs> potash anyway. So, um, uh, and it'll be good for the garden. Um, uh, so I, I don't I don't really know. You you've got me there. You're thinking it. it a higher level than I am capable of thinking. Um, I, so but all this proves in terms of, of what I've said is that I'm no genius here. This is a, a hugely important issue that I have not ever once really sat down and tried to address in my own mind. Um, how do genius people elevate society if from your book and your perspective? Uh, how to elevate society? Well, um, as a process, let's think of a simple uh, sort of metaphor here. We all like to use the idea of thinking outside the box. Oh, the genius thinks outside the box. Okay, so we'll take that. There are people that come along and say periodically, Steve Jobs would be a good example. Einstein, I mean, they're, they all, one way or another, Beethoven, 
doctor, they, they all uh, say, this is stupid. What we're doing is stupid. I mean, there's Jeff Bezos. He looked at shopping. This is stupid. You could see the internet was, was um, expanding at 2,300 times usage, 2,300, uh, a factor of 2,300 per year. Um, shopping is stupid. You drive to one store, you drive. That's, that's not a good way of doing things in this planet today. You drive to one store, you can't find it. You gotta drive 15 minutes over to this store to find it, still can't find it. And, uh, and why not just look at it on, online or talk to somebody, whatever, and have it shipped to you instantaneously. So that's a, a kind of um, transformative idea. They, they see something that could be done, this annoys them, they're gonna fix it. And um, they go off to fix it by stepping aside. Other people looking at this person outside the box say, my, that's a good idea. Maybe I should do that. And then collectively, all of society begins to change. So uh, it's it, you know, how do geniuses elevate society? It's simply by having a vision, being a visionary, having imagination to see what the world could be and having and showing that it's an interesting uh, again metaphysical issue here supposing you you see it but you don't share it with others or you see it and you don't try make a conscious effort through advertising or publishing or whatever to convince other people this is the way the world should be are you still a genius but uh, that's what i think geniuses do they see the world differently they show the world how the world could be different and eventually their vision is so correct and so compelling that every Everybody comes over to their side and lo and behold we have a, a new box and then from that new box some other genius will step out and begin some other far-seeing person will step out and begin to do things differently and on and on this continual process will go beautiful um, what can be you kind of that goes with the next question which is what can be learned from geniuses by others anything to add to that because they're kind of connected there uh, well, in an odd way, this goes back to the idea of creative destruction. Be careful what you wish for. I used to joke in this regard, and, and I shouldn't be gender specific here, So, but let me say, never let your daughter marry a genius. Never let your son marry a genius. Let, never let your uh, transgender child marry or join partner, whatever form they want to take with a, with a genius, because they'll probably make their life uh, miserable. It's in a it puts you, as I like to say, you would be forced in a situation where you have to take one for the team. Mm -hmm. You take all the abuse, the neglect that the, the uh, uh, a genius has to offer as the genius, oblivious to those around him, races down the path to ultimate uh, uh, transforming the world. Um, so the rest of us just have to stand, stand by, sort of take that, and then be, and we're willing to take it because ultimately we benefit from the transformative change that the genius brings to the world. That 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 goes into the concept of sacrifice. You know, the concept of sacrificial lambs and and sacrificial uh, things <laughs> in the Bible and everywhere. And yeah, that's it. That's a good point. That's great. Agnus Dei Quitolis Peccata Mundi. Um, yeah, uh, the sacrificial lamb. Um, yeah, in that case, in that, we all sort of are, are being sacrificed for the Savior figure here, but oftentimes the Savior figure is right, although ironically, in this case, at least in Christian theology, the Savior sacrifices himself for everyone else. And the people around sacrifice themselves for the benefit, potentially, if they feel like. It, right? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, how important is inspiration to a genius and the ability to channel and translate it into outcome? And what I mean by that is a genius uh, uh, can, like, can can go high and then can fall down. But when a genius falls down, and for example, there's either writer's block or the inability to concentrate or some overwhelming situation uh, which humanly uh, takes away the focus, um, you know, how important is inspiration? How does the genius uh, get back to it? Or do you think it just, it, the genius just needs space to get their genius back? 
I think they do need space. I think they need a particular kind of environment, a particular mindset. I don't think they're aware of this mindset that they get into. Um, and this is a project I'm working on at the moment having to do with relaxation as a kind of key to to creativity, even, even things like such as listening to music or exercise or looking at the ocean or meditation, mindfulness, uh, exposure to nature, whatever it might happen to be, dreaming, relaxation, sleep, taking baths, all of this. Uh, so I think that geniuses do this. They may not be fully aware of it, maybe sub, sort of subconsciously um, follow these patterns because they realize, uh, again, subconsciously that this is where their creative ideas come from. So, but what you said there, how important is inspiration? Well, it's just, inspirations are just insights inspiration are just insights you know you, you have an insight um and then you have to put yourself in an environment in a mindset that allows you to have these frequently i don't really sense all this reading that these people ever really uh came had long periods of of, of inertia um uh, uh, well, sort of creative impotency um they seem to just be so obsessive they had the capacity to grind it out continually and if it wasn't going well they just keep grinding. Maybe that's what that word grit means, I, I, I guess. Um, so um, insights, yes, you need insights. They come from visions, and the visions come from putting yourself in a particular uh, mindset that, allow you, that allows you to have these sorts of visions. And then in my mind, you have to put... Uh, hit the, the switch in the other direction. Now you got to focus, and now you got to get the product out the door to have impact. Um, some geniuses do that. They're just potential geniuses because they don't change the world. But by my definition, the genius not only has to have the insights, but has to flip that switch and get the product, as I say, out the door so as to impact and change the world. Let me ask you this. So once the product, uh, once the genius does that, releases the product, and uh, releases several products and then let's say they get tired um, they get tired of everything or, or, or their genius maybe they get tired of their own pulling and inertia um, do you think there's a step where they can just find peace while alive or do you think they need death to complete their genius I don't know. Did you, say, did you say they need death to complete their genius? Yeah, because if if, if genius is is constant pulling uh, of the of the energy to create, um, and a person just feels like they they want peace, can they get peace without creating, without being their no, genius? They will so. never stop. Why am I going up to New York to talk to a book agent on the after, three o'clock in the afternoon on mm -hmm. November eighteenth? Uh, because if I don't, I'm going to die. <laughs> and in other words, I think when we stop having this next obsession, our life has no no meaning. What was that great thing, James Joyce? Better to pass from this world in the full passion, in the full glory of a passion than to fade weakly or aimlessly into the distance, something like that. If you're setting up, if you're gonna go out, go out in a blaze. You may be wrong, you're probably delusional, but you'll probably live longer, and who knows, maybe you're right. <laughs> So that, that's my thinking at the moment. I don't think the, and Edison said, you know, with this Thomas said, Thomas, are you ever going to retire? To retire? Well, life uh, has, uh, has been an earthly paradise for me. He says, life has been an earthly, this has been an earthly paradise for me. Why this work? Why would I ever stop working? That's beautiful. I wish you great luck with your um, meeting with the agent, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and then I'll, I'll sure meet up with the, the greatest agent of them all, and he'll probably take me to task for my behavior during my uh, terrestrial life here. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that you've been uh, very helpful to many people. Uh, tell me, uh, Craig, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience? Because I think that this this conversation has been just um, in every way, spiritually and intellectually, just a diamond. 
Well, it's very interesting, uh, Miguel, because um, in all of this, I guess what I've got here is what I think of, I'm a devout, in terms of religion, a devout secular humanist, mm -hmm. a devout secular humanist. I never think of the traditional theology of this at all. Mm -hmm. And there very clearly is another way of, of forming and analyzing the human experience. And even though I claim to have written a book here on genius, I'm no genius again because I'm, I may be only seeing it best half of the picture. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's that. Is there anything else I would like to say? I would say that this is this kind of these kinds of conversations are good and exhilarating because they show you that you can always, no matter how old you are, continue to learn more. That's true. And your book, the book again is called The Hidden Habits of Genius by Craig Wright, Professor Craig Wright, is an exceptional book, also chosen um, by Amazon as one of its uh, best books of October 2020. Um, it's really a fantastic book, a book that stood out. You know, what I love to do is I went to the bookstore just to browse and I'm looking at this and that and then your book comes along and it's just, it's you know, it's an original. And I pick it up and I go, well, this one I'm interested in. And then I look in the back and I said, let me contact this incredible author. So I just love your book. And I think that it's a, a book for for people to read. It's a book that should be made into into courses all around. You know, if I may say one last point, that's exactly what I'm doing, uh, Michael. I'm, as soon as I sign off with, with our dis discussion here, I'm going to go, I'm putting the final touches on one of these massive open online courses because I think that this is the format that this material belongs in, is a more extensive and more visual type of course. This course will come with discussions, but over 700 slides, images of all these two geniuses and how to how to make the lives of all of us better, I think. So it's interesting that you should mention that. It's not only a book, it's, it's a larger project of a, of a of an open, massive open online course. And how can it's people, a, uh, the website for the course, or how can people get more information? Yeah, we'll keep it out for it. It won't be released until about the 1st of January, mm -hmm. but it's a Yale Coursera. If you Google around the 1st of January, uh, Yale Coursera Genius. Mm -hmm. It'll come up, I'm sure. Okay. And okay, wonderful. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I accept my thanks for uh, the um, for inviting me, and I, I thank also our uh, our listeners for being uh, patient enough to listen to me. <laughs> well, you've been fantastic. I thank you deeply.